Good day, everyone. Today, we will discuss post-judgment remedies under the rules of court. What are the remedies of a losing litigant? The first thing that a litigant must do is to ascertain whether the judgment sought to be assailed is already final and executory. When does a judgment become final and executory? It becomes executory upon the expiration of the period to appeal from a judgment or order that finally disposes of the action or proceeding if no appeal has been duly perfected. A judgment also becomes executory after appeal taken from the judgment or order has been finally resolved. So, before a judgment becomes final and executory, the remedies of a litigant are the following. You have motion for reconsideration under Rule 37, motion for new trial under Rule 37, appeal under Rules 40, 41, 42, 43, and 45. However, if judgment becomes final and executory, the losing litigant still has available remedies. You have petition for relief from judgment under Rule 38, action to annul a judgment under Rule 47, petition for certiorari under Rule 65, and lastly, a collateral attack of a judgment is also possible. Let's begin our discussion with motion for reconsideration. A motion for reconsideration is one that is directed against a judgment or final order. This is filed within the period for taking an appeal. Take note that no motion for extension of time to file a motion for reconsideration shall be allowed under the rules of court. The period for appeal depends on whether the appeal is by mere notice of appeal or by record on appeal. If appeal is made by notice of appeal, the period for appeal is within 15 days after notice to the appellant of the judgment or final order appealed from. However, where record on appeal is required, the period is within 30 days from the notice of the judgment or final order. When is record on appeal required? Please take note that record on appeal shall be required only in special proceedings and in cases which allow multiple or separate appeals. What are the grounds for motion for reconsideration? When you file a motion for reconsideration, take note it must be in writing and a copy of the notice must be duly served on the adverse party. The motion may be anchored on any of the following grounds. Letter A, that the damages awarded are excessive. Letter B, that the evidence is insufficient to justify the decision or final order. Or the third possible ground is that the decision or final order is contrary to law. The timely filing of a motion for reconsideration interrupts the period of appeal. In the motion, you must specifically point out the findings or conclusions of the judgment or final order which are not supported by evidence or which are contrary to law. The motion must make express reference to the testimonial or documentary evidence or the provisions of law alleged to be contrary to such findings or Conclusion, non-compliance with the foregoing requirements would reduce the motion to a mere pro forma motion. What is the effect? It shall not toll the reglementary period of appeal even if your motion is timely filed. And the motion shall be resolved within 30 days from the time it is submitted for resolution. Please take note of these reminders. The pendency of the motion for reconsideration shall stay the execution of judgment or final resolution sought to be reconsidered. A motion for reconsideration of a judgment is a prohibited motion with respect to cases covered under the rules on summary procedure and small claims cases. So in an unlawful detainer or forcible entry cases, no motion for reconsideration is allowed to be filed at the municipal trial court. Meanwhile, in a petition for writ of amparo, the motion for reconsideration is prohibited with respect to an interlocutory or interim relief order. However, the rule does not prohibit the filing of a motion for reconsideration with respect to the final judgment or order that grants or denies a writ of amparo or a petition for a writ of habeas data. With respect to environmental cases, a 
a motion for reconsideration is allowed. If the motion for reconsideration is denied, the movement may appeal from the judgment or final order. So the judgment or final order is the one being appealed. You do not appeal from the order denying the motion for reconsideration because this is pursuant to Section 9, Rule 37, which provides that an order denying a motion for reconsideration is not appealable. The remedy is appeal from the judgment or final order. And what happens if your motion for reconsideration is denied by the court? You have the fresh period rule or the NAPES rule. The party whose motion for reconsideration is denied may appeal from the judgment or final order. The movement is given a fresh period of 15 days from receipt or notice of the order denying the motion for reconsideration, during which he is allowed to file a notice of appeal. So the fresh period rule applies to Rule 40 governing appeals from the MTC to the RTC, Rule 41 governing appeals from the RTC to the Court of Appeals, Rule 42 on petitions for review from the RTC to the Court of Appeals, Rule 43 on appeals from quasi-judicial agencies to the Court of Appeals, and Rule 45 governing appeals by certiorari to the Supreme Court. Let's proceed to motion for new trial under Rule 37. A motion for new trial is a remedy that seeks to temper the severity of a judgment or prevent a failure of justice, but the grant of new trial is addressed to the sound discretion of the court, which cannot be interfered unless there is a clear abuse shown. The motion for new trial is filed within the period for taking appeal, so same period for filing a motion for reconsideration, and also no motion for extension of time to file a motion for new trial shall be allowed. So your period for appeal depends on whether the appeal is by a mere notice of appeal or by record on appeal. Where appeal is one made by notice of appeal, you have 15 days after notice to the appellant of the judgment or final order appealed from. Where record on appeal is required, the period is 30 days from notice of judgment or final order. So you have 15 days or 30 days during which you may file a motion for new trial. That filing of a timely motion for new trial interrupts the period to appeal. So same effect with filing a motion for reconsideration. And your motion for new trial shall be resolved within 30 days from the time it is submitted for resolution. What are the grounds for a motion for new trial? Aside from the fact that your motion must be in writing and your motion or notice must be duly served to the adverse party, these are the grounds to be alleged in your motion for new trial. You may allege fraud, accident, mistake, or excusable negligence which ordinary prudence could not have guarded against and by reason of which the aggrieved party has probably been impaired in his rights. So. A motion based on fame shall be supported by your affidavit of merits. That is your first ground. Or your second ground for new trial is newly discovered evidence, which he could not with reasonable diligence have discovered and produced at the trial, and which if presented would probably alter the result. So if your ground is newly discovered evidence, your motion shall be supported by affidavits of your witnesses by whom such evidence is expected to be given or by duly authenticated documents which are proposed to be introduced in evidence. Take note, non-compliance with the foregoing requirements would reduce your motion to a mere pro forma motion which it shall not toll the running of the reglementary period of appeal. So make sure you comply with these requirements. What are the contents in your Affidavit of Merits? In your Affidavit of Merits, the moving party must show that he has a meritorious defense. Your, mo your Affidavit must contain facts constituting the movement's good and substantial defense, which he may prove if the petition were granted. But it must be shown in the Affidavit which should accompany the motion for new trial. 
take note that mere allegations that one has a meritorious defense and good cause are mere conclusions. So it do not provide the court with any basis for determining the nature and merit of your case. So that's why your affidavit of merits must state facts and not mere opinion or conclusion of law. For affidavit of merits, this is required if your motion for new trial is founded on fame, fraud, accident, mistake, or excusable negligence. Another ground for a motion for new trial is newly discovered evidence. It must be shown in your motion that the evidence was discovered after trial. Such evidence could not have been discovered and produced at the trial even with the exercise of reasonable diligence. So, it must be presented that the newly discovered evidence is material and not merely cumulative, corroborative, or impeaching. And the evidence is of such weight that it would probably change the judgment if admitted by the court. As a gentle reminder, if the newly discovered evidence could have been very well presented during trial with the exercise of reasonable diligence, then the same could not be considered as a newly discovered evidence. And if your motion for new trial is denied, the movement has a fresh period of 15 days from receipt or notice of the order denying the motion for new trial within which he may file a notice of appeal. Please take note that a second new trial is allowed. While it is true that a second motion for reconsideration is not allowed, however, second motion for new trial is authorized by the rules of court. A second motion for reconsideration is prohibited and can only be allowed on extraordinary persuasive reasons and only after express leave had been obtained. Whereas, when a ground for new trial was not existing or available when the first motion was made, a second motion for new trial may be filed within the period allowed but excluding the time during which the first motion had been pending. Let's proceed to appeal. An appeal is the remedy available to a litigant seeking to reverse or modify a judgment based on the merits of a case. Appeal is used to correct errors of judgment of the lower court or tribunal. So these errors can be in the form of errors in the application of the rules on evidence, errors in the appreciation of the credibility of witnesses, or errors in the appreciation of the facts of the case. Appeal is not designed to correct acts constituting grave abuse of discretion amounting to lack or excess of jurisdiction or other errors of jurisdiction of the court. So it is a basic procedural rule that errors of judgment are correctable by appeal, while errors of jurisdiction are correctable by certiorari. A petition for certiorari under Rule 65 is available only when there is no appeal or any plain, speedy, adequate remedy in the ordinary course of law. That's why the availability of an appeal or some other remedy precludes the application of certiorari. It is very basic that when you file a petition for certiorari, it must be alleged that there is no appeal or no plain, speedy, or adequate remedy in the ordinary course of law. Otherwise, your petition for certiorari shall be dismissed because there is another remedy available which could have been availed of by the litigant. Another point is that the right to appeal is neither a natural right nor is a component of due process. It is a mere statutory privilege and this may be exercised only in the manner in accordance with the provisions of the law. Speaking of appeal, it is required that the litigant shall pay the full amount of docket fees within the prescribed period because payment of docket fees is mandatory for the perfection of an appeal. It is also a rule that the findings of trial judges will not be disturbed on appeal in the absence of any clear showing that they have overlooked, misunderstood, or misapplied some facts or circumstances of weight and substance that could have altered the judgment. An appeal may be taken from a judgment or final order that completely disposes of the case or 
of a particular matter declared by the rules to be appealable. That's why under Section 1, Rule 41, no appeal may be taken from any of the following. An order denying a petition for relief from judgment. An interlocutory order is not appealable. An order disallowing or dismissing an appeal is not appealable. An order denying a motion to set aside judgment by consent, confession, or compromise on the ground of fraud, mistake, duress, or any other ground vitiating consent is also not appealable. An order of execution is not appealable. A judgment or final order with respect to counterclaims, cross-claims, and third-party complaints while the main case is pending is not appealable. And lastly, an order dismissing an action without prejudice is not appealable. How do you distinguish notice of appeal from record and appeal? An appeal is made by filing a notice of appeal with the court which rendered the judgment or final order appealed from and by serving a copy thereof upon an adverse party. As a rule, no record on appeal shall be required except in cases involving special proceedings and other cases of multiple or separate appeals are allowed. The record on appeal is required so the appellate court may have a record of the proceedings to resolve a separate and distinct issue raised in the appeal because the original records remain with the trial court which allows the court accord at the lower court to still resolve the other issues of the case not made subject of an appeal. For example, in a complaint for expropriation where there are two stages in every action for expropriation, the first stage is the determination of the lawful right of the plaintiff to take the property sought to be expropriated. So this order of expropriation may be appealed from by a party by filing a record on appeal. What are the errors to be considered on appeal? As a general rule, the appellate court shall consider no error unless stated in the assignment of errors. That's why in your appellant's brief or in your memorandum, you must indicate in your assignment of errors the errors committed by the lower court in its decision. However, the court may consider an error not assigned as error or raised on appeal provided that the same falls under any of the following categories. Number one, it is an error that affects the jurisdiction over the subject matter. Second, it is an error that affects the validity of the judgment appealed from. Or third, it is an error which affects the validity of the proceedings. Or number four, it is an error closely related to or dependent of an assigned error or properly argued in the brief. Or number five, it is a plain and clerical error. Some reminders or pointers. Please take note that the denial of a petition for relief from judgment is subject only to certiorari under Rule 65. So you cannot file a petition for review and certiorari, which is a mode of appeal, because you cannot appeal from a judgment from a petition for relief from judgment. Second, if a case is dismissed by the RTC because of failure of the plaintiffs to appear during pre-trial, the remedy is appeal to the Court of Appeals under Rule 41 since if the decision of the RTC is silent with respect to the dismissal, whether the same is with or without prejudice, the presumption is the dismissal is with prejudice pursuant to Section 5, Rule 18 on pre-trial, and a decision with prejudice is an adjudication of merits. That's why the remedy is appeal. Third reminder, a dismissal on the ground of bar by a prior judgment, prescription, or litis pendentia precludes the refiling of the same action or claim because the dismissal is with prejudice. So the remedy of the grieved party is to appeal not file a petition for certiorari under Rule 65. Fourth point, an order of a trial court dismissing a case for failure to prosecute is a final order. So the dismissal has the effect of an adjudication upon the merits. That's why the remedy is to appeal. Fifth, in case the judgment or final order is not appealable, then the only remedy is to file a special civil action on certiorari under Rule 65.
Let's discuss appeal from the municipal trial courts to the regional trial courts under Rule 40. An appeal from a judgment or final order of the municipal trial court may be taken to the regional trial court by filing a notice of appeal within 15 days after notice of the judgment with the court that rendered the judgment or final order appealed from or by filing a notice of appeal and record on appeal within 30 days for cases where record on appeal is allowed. Now, in your notice of appeal, make sure you serve a copy of the notice and record on the adverse party. In your notice of appeal, you shall indicate the parties to the appeal, the judgment or final order or part thereof appealed from, and state the material dates showing the timeliness of the appeal so that the court of origin may be able to evaluate the, the timeliness of the filing of your notice of appeal. Please also take note that the appellant shall pay with the clerk of court at the court of origin the full amount of the appellate court docket and other lawful fees because this is required for the perfection of an appeal. Within 15 days from the perfection of the appeal, the clerk of court of the lower court shall transmit the original record or the record on appeal to the regional trial court and it will be the regional trial court which will decide the case. A party's appeal by notice of appeal is deemed perfected as to him upon the filing of the notice of appeal in due time. Meanwhile, a party's record on appeal is deemed perfected as to him with respect to the subject matter thereof upon the approval of the record on appeal filed in due time. So, with respect to notice of appeal, it is deemed perfected upon the filing of the notice of appeal in due time. But with respect to an appeal by record on appeal, it is deemed perfected upon the approval of the record on appeal filed in due time. Now, upon receipt of the complete record or the record on appeal, the clerk of court of the regional trial court shall notify the parties of such fact and the parties shall be required to file the respective memorandum and thereafter the case shall be submitted for decision. The decision shall be rendered by the regional trial court on the basis of the entire records of the proceeding in the court of origin plus the memorandum filed by the parties at the regional trial court. Let's take up appeal from the regional trial courts to the Court of Appeals under Rule 41. An ordinary appeal or appeal by writ of error where judgment rendered by the RTC in the exercise of its original jurisdiction is covered by appeal under Rule 41. This mode of appeal is in relation to Rule 44 where questions of fact or mixed questions of fact and law are involved. The appeal shall be taken by filing a notice of appeal at the regional trial court within 15 days from notice of the judgment or final order appealed from, or if the appeal involves a record on appeal, then by filing a notice of appeal and record on appeal within 30 days at the regional trial court. Where the record on appeal is required, the appellant shall file a notice of appeal and a record on appeal within 30 days from notice of the judgment or final order at the RTC. With respect to habeas corpus cases, the appeal shall be taken within 48 hours from notice of judgment or final order. If the appeal from the regional trial court involves purely questions of law, you do not appeal the case to the Court of Appeals. Instead, the case shall be appealed to the Supreme Court by filing a petition for review on certiorari, which shall be filed if issues raised involve only questions of law. Now, within the period for taking an appeal, the appellant shall pay to the clerk of court the full amount of the appellate court docket fees. Uh, as to perfection, a party's appeal by filing a notice of appeal is deemed perfected as to him upon the filing of the notice of appeal in due time. With respect to a record on appeal, it is deemed perfected as to him with respect to the subject matter thereof upon the approval of the record on appeal filed in due time. Within 30 days after perfection of all the appeals, 
the clerk of court shall verify the correctness and completeness of the records and certify the correctness and to transmit the same to the appellate court upon receiving the records as well as the proof of payment of the docket and other lawful fees the clerk of court of the court of appeals shall docket the same and notify the parties to file the respective brief so the appellant shall file his brief within 45 days from receipt of the notice to file brief with proof of service to the appellee meanwhile the appellee shall file his brief within 45 days from receipt of the appellant's brief let's discuss petition for review from the regional trial courts to the court of appeals under rule 42 rule 42 applies to an appeal from the judgment or final order of the regional trial court to the court of appeals in cases decided by the rtc in the exercise of its appellate jurisdiction so in rule 42 the regional trial court is in the exercise of its appellate jurisdiction in rule 41 the rtc is in the exercise of its original jurisdiction rule 42 presupposes that a case was originally filed at the municipal trial court which was appealed to the regional trial court and the decision of the regional trial court is now subject to appeal at the court of appeals that's why you need to file a petition for review under rule 42 when do you file the petition appeal shall be made within 15 days from notice of the decision sought to be reviewed or of the denial of the petitioner's motion for a new trial or reconsideration filed in due time after judgment as a rule petition for review under rule 42 shall be filed within 15 days however the petitioner is allowed to file a motion for extension of time to file petition praying for extension of 15 days provided there is a proper motion and payment of the full amount of docket or another lawful fees and deposit for cost but the motion must be filed before the expiration of the original 15-day period no further extension shall be granted except for the most compelling reason and in no case to exceed 15 days the petition shall state the following um, you must present a concise statement of the matters involved it must also state the issues raised the the errors of law or fact or both allegedly committed by the trial court Another part of the petition is the argument relied upon for the allowance of the appeal. And it must also indicate the specific material dates showing that the petition was filed on time. Now, this is what we call as the material data rule, the requirement to indicate the relevant dates. And this applies not only to Rule 42, but also to other petitions like Rule 65, Rule 43, and Rule 45. And please also include in your petition a, the certification against forum shopping because non-inclusion of this certification shall result to the dismissal of your petition. The failure to comply with these requirements regarding the payment of the docket and other lawful fees, deposit for costs, proof of service, contents and documents which should accompany the petition shall be sufficient ground for the dismissal of your petition. Um, please take note that a notice of appeal and petition for review are distinct procedures which cannot be loosely interchanged with one another. A notice of appeal is filed with the RTC that rendered the assailed decision. Meanwhile, a petition for review is filed with the Court of Appeals. A notice of appeal is required when the RTC exercises original jurisdiction with respect to its decision, judgment, or final order. Meanwhile, petition for review is required when such issuance was in the exercise of the RTC's appellate jurisdiction. So let's have an example. Um, the plaintiff received an adverse decision in an action to recover a sum of money. So the amount is within the 2 million peso jurisdictional threshold. The plaintiff appealed the judgment with the RTC and this time he lost again. So the judgment of the RTC was rendered in the exercise of its appellate jurisdiction. If plaintiff desires to appeal from this judgment, 
his remedy is to file a verified petition for review under Rule 42 at the Court of Appeals. Why? Because the RTC is in exercise of its appellate jurisdiction. Assuming the RTC is in the exercise of its original jurisdiction, what is the remedy of the plaintiff? The plaintiff may file a notice of appeal at the regional trial court. Appeals from quasi-judicial agencies to the Court of Appeals. Appeals from judgments and final orders of quasi-judicial bodies or agencies enumerated in Rule 43 are now required to be brought to the Court of Appeals. Among the agencies are the following, Civil Service Commission, Central Board of Assessment Appeals, Securities and Exchange Commission, Office of the President, Land Registration Authority, Social Security Commission, Civil Aeronautics Board, Bureau of Patents, Trademarks and Technology Transfer, National Electrification Administration, Energy Regulatory Board, National Telecommunications Commission, Department of Agrarian Reform, Government Service Insurance System, Employees Compensation Commission, Agricultural Inventions Board, Insurance Commission, Philippine Atomic Energy Commission, Board of Investments, Construction Industry Arbitration Commission, and Voluntary Arbitrators Authorized by Law. So with respect to any of these quasi-judicial agencies, their decisions are appealable to the Court of Appeals by filing a verified petition for review under Rule 43 at the Court of Appeals within 15 days from receipt of the assailed judgment or final order. And thereafter, the respondent is allowed to file a comment to the petition within 10 days from notice. So the respondent shall receive a resolution from the Court of Appeals informing him that the petition was filed and that the respondent is required to file a comment to the petition within 10 days from notice. The appeal under Rule 43 is taken to the Court of Appeals whether the appeal involves a question of fact, a question of law, or mixed questions of fact and law. Appeal shall be taken by filing a verified petition for review with the Court of Appeals within 15 days from notice of the award, judgment, or final order or resolution. Rule 43 presupposes that the issue raised is one of error of judgment. So the fact, it may involve a question of fact, law, or mixed questions of fact and law. But if the act imputed against the administrative or quasi-judicial body is one with grave abuse of discretion, then Rule 43 does not apply. Please be reminded that the appeal via Rule 43 shall not stay the award, judgment, final order, or resolution sought to be reviewed. So this means that the judgment may be subject to execution despite the pendency of the appeal under Rule 43 unless the execution is enjoined by a writ of preliminary injunction or a temporary restraining order issued by the Court of Appeals. In the petition for review, it shall state the following the full names of the parties to the case without, without impleding the court or agencies either as petitioners or respondents. So you do not implead the court or agency as petitioner or respondent. Your petition shall also contain a statement of facts and issues involved and the grounds relied upon for review. In the petition, make sure it shall contain clearly legible duplicate original or a certified true copy of the award judgment, final order, resolution appealed from, together with the certified true copies of such material portions of the record referred to in other supporting papers. In your petition, it must also include a sworn certification against forum shopping because this is required uh, in the rules of court. And please be reminded of the specific material dates. So make sure your petition shall state the specific material dates showing that your petition was filed within the period stated therein. The failure to comply with the foregoing requirements, so with respect to the payment of docket and other lawful fees, the deposit for cost, proof of service of the petition and the contents and the documents which should accompany the petition 
shall be sufficient ground for the dismissal of your petition. Another point is, with respect to the rulings of the Office of the Ombudsman, their ruling may either be in administrative disciplinary cases or in criminal cases. For administrative disciplinary cases, the rulings of the Office of the Ombudsman are appealable to the Court of Appeals via petition for review under Rule 43. So the appeal may raise questions of fact, of law, or mix questions of fact and law. However, the appeal shall not stay the award, judgment, final order, resolution sought to be reviewed. That's why to stay the judgment, make sure you can secure from the Court of Appeals a writ of preliminary injunction or a temporary restraining order. How about in criminal cases? When the aggrieved party is questioning the Office of the Ombudsman's finding of lack of probable cause, the remedy is certiorari under Rule 65 to be filed with the Supreme Court, not with the Court of Appeals. Appeal by certiorari to the Supreme Court under Rule 45. This mode of appeal is available with respect to the, the judgment, final order resolution, of the Court of Appeals, Sandigan Bayan, Court of Tax Appeals, or the Regional Trial Court with respect to pure questions of law. So the appeal shall be in the form of verified petition, which shall be filed within 15 days from notice of the judgment, final order, or resolution appealed from, or within 15 days from notice of the denial of the petitioner's motion for new trial or motion for reconsideration filed in due time. In a petition for review and certiorari in the Rule 45, it shall contain the following. The full name of the appealing party as the petitioner and the adverse party as respondent, but you do not implead the lower court or judges thereof either as petitioners or respondents, only the parties. Second, please indicate the material dates showing when the notice of the judgment or final order or resolution was received or when a motion for new trial or reconsideration, if any, was filed, and when notice of the denial thereof was received. Also state in the petition a concise statement of the matters involved, your reasons or arguments relied for the allowance of the petition. And it must be accompanied by clearly legible duplicate original or certified true copy of the judgment or final order resolution certified by the clerk of court of the court of coup, and the requisite number of plain copies thereof and such material portions of the record as would support the petition. And please don't forget, your petition must contain a sworn certification against forum shopping. And also, your petition must be verified. So also attach a verification. So the petitioner shall pay the corresponding docket and other lawful fees to the clerk of court of the Supreme Court and proof of service of a copy thereof on the lower court concerned, and on the adverse party shall be submitted together with the petition. An appeal under Rule 45 is not a matter of right, but this is of sound judicial discretion, so this will only be granted when special and important reasons could justify the petition. The Supreme Court may consider allowing the petitions for any of these reasons when the question of substance has not yet been determined by the Supreme Court and yet it was decided by the lower court or when the lower court decided a question of substance in a way that is probably not in accord with law or applicable decisions of the Supreme Court or when the court below has departed from the accepted and useful course of judicial proceedings or so far sanctioned such de departure by a lower court as to call for the exercise of the power of supervision of the Supreme Court. Petition for review and certiorari applies in any of the following cases. On appeal from a judgment or final order of the regional trial court, where only questions of law are raised or involved. Or second, appeal from judgment, final order, resolutions of the Court of Appeals, where the petition shall raise only questions of law. Or third, appeal from judgment, final order, resolutions of the Sandigan Bayan where the petition shall raise only questions of law. 
or with respect to appeal from the decisions or rulings of the Court of Tax Appeals and Bank. So CTA and Bank, not CTA Division, because decisions of CTA Division shall be appealed to the CTA and Bank. And in fact, before uh, filing an appeal at the CTA and Bank, it is a prerequisite to file a motion for reconsideration before the CTA Division. Number five, appeal from a judgment or final order in a petition for a writ of amparo to the Supreme Court. So appeal may raise questions of fact, questions of law, or both questions of law and fact. Number six, appeal from petition for a writ of kalikasan. And number seven, appeals from a judgment or final order in a petition for a writ of habeas data. As a rule, the Supreme Court is not a trier of fact. That's why an appeal by certiorari taken to the Supreme Court from the RTC submitting issues of fact may be referred to the Court of Appeals for decision or appropriate action. And the determination of the Supreme Court on whether or not issues of fact are involved should be final. So the Supreme Court is not a trier of fact. That is the general rule. As exception, questions of fact may be determined by the Supreme Court in a petition for Rule 45 when, number one, the conclusion of the Court of Appeals is grounded entirely on speculations, surmises, and conjectures. Second, the inference made is manifestly mistaken, absurd, or impossible. Or third, when there is grave abuse of discussion. Fourth, when the judgment is based on misapprehension of facts. Number five, when the findings of facts are conflicting. Or number six, when the Court of Appeals, in making its findings, went beyond the issues of the case and the same is contrary to the admissions of both the appellant and the appellee. Number seven, when the findings of fact of the Court of Appeals are contrary to those of the trial court. And number eight, when the findings of fact are conclusions without citation of the specific evidence on which they are based. Number nine, when the facts set forth in the petition, as well as in the petitioner's main and reply briefs, are not disputed by the respondents. Or number 10, when the findings of fact of the Court of Appeals are premised on the supposed absence of evidence and contradicted by the evidence on record. Some gentle reminders. The failure to comply with the requirements under Rule 45 regarding the payment of docket and other lawful fees, deposit for cost, proof of service of the petition, and the contents of and the documents which should accompany the petition shall be ground for its dismissal. The Supreme Court may, on its own initiative, deny the petition on the ground that the appeal is without merit, that it is prosecuted manifestly for delay, or that the questions raised therein are too unsubstantial to require consideration. So, for purposes of determining whether the petition should be denied or be given due course, the Supreme Court may require the filing of such pleadings, briefs, memoranda, or the submission of documents as it may deem necessary. So, for your bird's eye view, these are the different remedies available under Rule 40, Rule 41, Rule 42, Rule 43, and Rule 45. What are the remedies after judgment becomes final and executory? Your first remedy is to file a petition for relief from judgment under Rule 38. Petition for relief is a remedy provided by law where the decision or order is entered through fraud, accident, mistake, or excusable negligence. So this is fame. The remedy is equitable in character, so this is allowed only in exceptional cases where there's no available or adequate remedy provided by law or by the rules. That's why petition for relief from judgment cannot be availed of when a party is another remedy available to him, which may be in the form of a motion for new trial or appeal from an adverse decision of the trial court or when he was not prevented by fraud, accident, mistake, or excusable negligence from filing such motion or taking such appeal. As a rule, a party who has filed a motion for new trial which was denied cannot file a petition for relief from judgment because 
these two remedies are exclusive of each other. What are the grounds to be stated in your petition for relief from judgment? The petition for relief may be filed on the following grounds. When the judgment or final order is entered through fraud, accident, mistake, or excusable negligence, the petition shall be filed with such court and in the same case, and shall pray that the judgment, order, or proceeding be set aside. Or when your ground is that the petitioner has been prevented from taking an appeal by fraud, accident, mistake, or excusable negligence, the petition for relief from judgment shall be filed with such court and in the same case, so not in another a higher court. And in your petition, you pray that the appeal be given due course. Please note that petitions for relief from judgment should be filed with and resolved by the court in the same case from which the petition arose since a petition for relief from judgment is not a mode of appeal. An appeal involves the invocation of the authority of the higher court. With respect to extrinsic fraud, this is a type of fraud which the prevailing party caused to prevent the losing party from being heard on his action or defense. So this type of fraud concerns not the judgment itself, but the manner in which the judgment was obtained. For example, um, the petition of a de defending party would be justified where the plaintiff deliberately caused with the process server's connivance the service of summons on defendant at the wrong address and thus succeeded in getting a judgment by default against him. So this is a type of extrinsic fraud. When do you file petition for relief from judgment? You have two important dates. You have 60 days and six months. 60 days from knowledge of the judgment, order or other proceedings sought to be set aside, and six months from entry of such judgment, order, or other proceedings. So please take note of the 60 days and six months because these two periods must concur and both periods are also not extendable and never interrupted. That's why strict compliance with these periods stems from the equitable character and nature of the petition for relief because a petition for relief is only allowed in exceptional cases as when there is no other available or adequate remedy. This is the last chance given by law to litigants to question a final judgment or order. And failure to avail of such last chance within the grace period fixed by the rules is fatal. In your petition, make sure the same is verified and accompanied with affidavit of merits showing fraud, accident, mistake, or excusable negligence relied upon, and the facts constituting the petitioner's good and substantial cause of action or defense as the case may be. If the petition is sufficient in form and substance to justify relief, the court in which the action is filed shall issue an order requiring the adverse party to answer the same within 15 days from receipt. After hearing, if the court finds the allegations to be true, it shall set aside the judgment, final order, or other proceeding complained of, and then the court shall proceed to hear and determine the case as if a timely motion for new trial or reconsideration had been filed, or where the prayer petitioner is to give due course to his appeal because he was prevented from taking an appeal through fame, and the court finds the allegations of the petition to be true, then the court shall set aside the previous denial of the appeal and shall give due course to the said appeals, and the court shall then elevate the records of the appeal case as if a timely and proper appeal had been made. Annulment of Judgment, Final Orders, Resolutions under Rule 47 An action for annulment of judgment is a remedy in equity, exceptional in character, and this is availed only when other remedies are wanting. So the petition should show that the ordinary remedies of new trial, appeal, petition for relief, or other appropriate remedies are no longer available. It is important to show that such remedies have been made unavailable without fault on the part of the petitioner. And please note that when the petitioner had already brought a petition for relief under Rule 38 based on extrinsic fraud, 
then he cannot any more avail of an action for annulment of judgment under Rule 47 based on the same ground used in the prior remedy. Rule 47 limits the applicability of the remedy of annulment of judgment to final judgments, orders, or resolution because a final judgment is one which finally disposes of a case, leaving nothing more for the court to do in respect thereto. But this remedy may not be invoked not only where the petitioner or parties failed to avail himself of the remedies of new trial, appeal, or petition for relief, but also where he has availed himself of such remedies but lost. The remedy of annulment of judgment is also an exception to the final judgment rule or to the doctrine of immutability of judgment or conclusiveness of judgments. This is because when the judgment is annulled, the old judgment will be set aside. Where and when to file a petition for annulment of judgment? The action is commenced by the filing of a verified petition with the proper court. If it is the judgment of the regional trial court which is sought to be annulled, then the action for annulment of judgment shall be filed with the Court of Appeals. If the decision sought to be annulled is that of a municipal trial court, then the verified petition shall be filed with the regional trial court having jurisdiction over the MTC. And the period for filing, if this is based on extrinsic fraud, the action must be filed within four years from its discovery. If the ground is based on lack of jurisdiction, the action must be brought before the action is barred by laches or estoppel. What are the grounds for annulment of judgment? Under Section 2, Rule 47, you have two grounds. You have extrinsic fraud and lack of jurisdiction. However, jurisprudence has recognized denial of due process as an additional ground. Extrinsic fraud. Extrinsic fraud in a petition for annulment refers to any fraudulent act of the prevailing party in litigation committed outside of the trial of the case where the defeated party is prevented from fully exhibiting his side by fraud or deception practiced on him by his opponents like by keeping him away from court or by giving him false promise of a compromise or where an attorney fraudulently or without authority connives at his defeat but Pure mistake or gross negligence of a lawyer does not amount to extrinsic fraud. Or fourth, if it is made to appear, the defendant had been duly served with summons even if none was served. Extrinsic fraud shall not be a valid ground if it was availed of or could have been availed of in a motion for new trial or in a petition for relief from judgment. Lack of jurisdiction as a ground for annulment of judgment refers to either lack of jurisdiction over the person of the defending party or lack of jurisdiction over the subject matter of the claim. Where the court has jurisdiction over the defendant and over the subject matter of the case, its decision will not be voided on the ground of absence of jurisdiction. Please note that the petitioner must show not a mere grave abuse of discretion but an absolute lack of jurisdiction because the concept of lack of jurisdiction as a ground to annul a judgment does not embrace abuse of discretion. A claim of grave abuse of discretion will support a petition for certiorari under Rule 65, but it will not support an action for an annulment of judgment. Denial of due process. Jurisprudence has recognized denial due process as an additional ground for annulment of judgment because the essence of due process is an opportunity to be heard as long as the parties are given the opportunity to be heard before judgment is rendered, the demands of due process are sufficiently met and the concept of due process also applies to administrative proceedings. What is the effect of annulment? An annulment of judgment based on lack of jurisdiction shall have the effect of setting aside the question judgment or final order and rendering the same null and void. But the judgment of annulment is without prejudice to the refiling of the original action in the proper court. The prescriptive period for the refiling of the original action shall be deemed suspended from the filing of such original action until the finality of the judgment of annulment. 
but the prescriptive period shall not be suspended where extrinsic fraud is attributable to the plaintiff in the original action. And second effect, where the judgment or final order is set aside and annulled on the ground of extrinsic fraud, the court upon motion may order the trial court to try the case as if a motion for new trial was granted. Petition for certiorari in the Rule 65. A petition for certiorari under Rule 65 is an original and independent action, and this is not, not part of the proceedings that resulted in the order assailed. The purpose of the certiorari in the Rule 65 is to correct errors of jurisdiction or grave abuse of discretion amounting to lack or excess of jurisdiction. So the principal office is only to keep the inferior court within the parameters of its jurisdiction. This is an extraordinary remedy allowed only and restrictively in truly exceptional cases. The remedy may only be used when there is no appeal or any other plain, speedy, or adequate remedy in the ordinary course of law. What are the requisites in filing a petition for certiorari in the Rule 65? The petition is directed against a tribunal, board, or officer exercising judicial or quasi-judicial functions. Such tribunal, board, or officers has acted without or in excess of jurisdiction or grave abuse of discretion amounting to lack or excess of jurisdiction. And you must allege in your petition that there is no appeal or any plain, speedy, or adequate remedy in the ordinary course of law. The general rule is that before filing a petition for certiorari in the Rule 65, the petitioner is mandated to comply with a condition precedent. And what is that? The filing of a motion for reconsideration of the assailed order and the subsequent denial thereof by the court ako. So file a motion for reconsideration first before filing a petition for certiorari under Rule 65. Why? To give chance to the tribunal border officer to correct itself through resolution in a motion for reconsideration. Exceptions, a motion for reconsideration is not required to be filed where the motion would be useless under the circumstances or number two, where the order is a patent nullity or number three, where questions raised in the petition had been duly raised and passed upon by the lower court or number four, where proceedings in the lower court is a nullity due to lack of due process and number five, where the issue raised is purely of law or public interest is involved. Rule 65 also requires the pleader petitioner to submit a certification against forum shopping. Material data rule. Section 3 of Rule 46 provides that there are three material dates that must be stated in a petition for certiorari. Number one, the date when notice of the judgment final order resolution was received. Second, the date when a motion for new trial or reconsideration was filed. And third, the date when notice of the denial thereof was received. What is the purpose of the material data rule? This requirement is the, for the purpose of determining the timeliness of the petition. And the failure to state the material dates is sufficient ground to dismiss the petition under the same rule. Now, the appellate court has the prerogative to dismiss the case outright for failure to comply with the formal requirements of an action filed under Rule 65. And finally, the last remedy after judgment becomes final and executory is a collateral attack of a judgment. How do you distinguish direct attack from a collateral attack? A direct attack of a judgment, for example, the filing of a petition for certiorari, is made through an action or proceeding, the main object of which is to annul, set aside, or enjoin the enforcement of such judgment if not yet carried into effect, or if the property has been disposed of, the aggrieved party may sue for recovery. Meanwhile, a collateral attack is made when, in another action to obtain a different relief, an attack on the judgment is made as an incident in said action. So this is proper only when the judgment on its face is null and void, as where it is patent that the court which rendered said judgment has no jurisdiction.
And that ends our discussion on post-judgment remedies. Thank you.